I want to invite you to take your Bible today and join me in the Gospel of John chapter 5. So today we're going to reside there for a few moments, but I want you to keep your Bibles open because we have several Old Testament passages that we're going to visit. Some may be familiar to you, some may seem a little antiquated in your thinking, but we're going to look at today a sermon entitled, The Loneliest Week Ever. So if you take notes, and I want to encourage you to do that, or maybe you can go back online and look at uh, and listen to the sermon later on, but I want to talk to you about the loneliest week ever. Let me say that again, the loneliest week ever. Follow with me in your copy of God's Word. John chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading in verse 39. These are the words of Jesus. Of course, if you carry the red letter edition, you'll know these words are in red. The Bible says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive." How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God only? Do not think that I will uh, accurse you to the Father. There is one that accursed you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For you had believed uh, Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. 
But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? May God add his blessings today as we look at the loneliest week ever. The setting of the scene for John chapter 5 is a confrontation that Jesus has with some of the religious leaders of his day. It was a confrontation because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day, and his accusers seemed to think that he somehow broke the law of God by healing on the Sabbath day, which he did not. He might have violated man-made oral tradition, but he did not break the law of God. So they criticized him for that. They accused him of that. And then they also accused him of blasphemy because he said that he and the Father were on the same level. He, he talked about the equality that he had with God the Father. So in John chapter 5, particularly the last half of John chapter 5, what you have is a series of witnesses, if you will, that step forward and they speak to the authority of Christ. They speak to the fact that Jesus really was one with God the Father, that he really did come into the world to save the world, that he really was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, in fact, if you want to just very quickly to preface my remarks this morning, look at some of these witnesses. I'll give them to you very quickly. Go down to verse number 31, and you will see the witness of Jesus' own words, how he spoke. If you go to verse 32, you see the witness of the Holy Spirit who testifies of Jesus' authority. If you go to verse 33 there, verse 33 and following, you find the witness of John the Baptist. Verse 36, you see the, the witness of how Jesus, the works that he did, testify that he was one with God. Then you go down to verse number 37. You see the witness of God the Father. So all of these witnesses kind of are presented by Jesus to help clarify in the thinking of the Jewish people that indeed he was who he said he was. The one we're, we will focus on this morning begins in verse number 39 and following, and it is the witness of the Old Testament scriptures. So that's going to be our focus for the day. How the Old Testament, in fact, I would say this morning, how all of the Bible is a love letter written by God, given to his son to pass along to this world of ours. All of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation the scarlet thread that runs through it is how God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. It is a love letter. It is a love letter of how paradise was lost but how paradise through the blood of Christ and his glorious resurrection on Easter Sunday, paradise would be regained. So what we'll do today is we're going to look at some of the Old Testament passages that validate Jesus' claims for who he said that he was and who he is. When we talk about the scripture, the Bible that we have today consists of how many books, church? How many books in the Bible? 66 books. But, but I don't say take your books and open them this morning. What do I say? I say take your Bible because all of the 66 books, though they are independent to some degree, they all are woven together to give us a beautiful tapestry of this love letter that God has sent to the world. So we call it the Bible, but it is made up of 66 books. Do you know that it was written by over 40 different authors over a period of time of 1,500 years, three different languages, three different continents of the world, and most of the authors did not even know one another. But when you read the scripture, you never find any inconsistencies. You never find any contradictions. What one author said in the Old Testament is validated and confirmed by what another may write in the New Testament. And it is beautifully woven together. How could that possibly be? I mean, how could one man write something in... Um, uh, uh, 700 years before Jesus was born, and another 700 or 100 years after Jesus died, and yet they fit together beautifully. It is because God is the author. 
God is the author and he moved upon men of old, gave them his word to, to write down, to record as he inspired them so that you and I could be confident that we have the word of God. So in our text this morning, in John chapter 5, Jesus challenges the re religious leaders with this. He said, you search those scriptures, the Torah, to them, the Old Testament. You look at the Old Testament. For in them you will find that they point to me. We begin today with Palm Sunday, which we recognize began the last week of Jesus' life. We call it Holy Week, or we call it Passion Week. I call it the loneliest week ever. Do you know the loneliest tree in the world is called the Tenere tree in the Sahara Desert? And it was the only tree for 250 miles in any direction. And it stood there in the Sahara Desert for over 300 years. I'm sad to report it. Actually, its demise happened when it was hit by a drunk driver. Can you believe that? But it was the oldest, it was the, the loneliest tree ever, all by itself out there 250 miles from any other tree. The loneliest whale in the world is the blue whale because science tells us that its vocal frequency cannot be heard by any other whales and they don't even know when the blue whale is near them. Psychologists tell us the loneliest day of the week is Saturday evening. The loneliest number is number one. And the loneliest of all the creatures on the planet is the human family. And when we talk about Passion Week being the loneliest week ever, it was not, it's not lonely for us, but it was certainly lonely for the Lord Jesus. When he came over the brow of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, announcing that he was the Messiah, he did not come with an entourage of Roman soldiers. He did not come in a jewel-studded chariot. He did not come with great pomp and circumstance that would ordinarily accompany a reigning king. But as the king of the Jews, Jesus came lowly, the Bible says, humbly, stoop-shouldered, riding on the back of a donkey. Soon his coronation service would be changed to a mock trial as he would be pushed through a kangaroo court. His 12 disciples who accompanied him for three years and they, they, watched him, they watched him heal the sick and raise the dead and teach the word of God for three years. But when he went to the cross, he died absolutely alone. All the disciples had fled. When you trace the steps of Jesus during Holy Week, he comes into Jerusalem on Sunday. On Monday, the scripture tells us that he goes into the temple and he takes a whip, turns over the tables of the money changers, and with that whip, he drives out those who are desecrating the temple of God. And he said, you have taken my father's house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. And as he cracks that whip, he runs them out of the temple. And on Monday, when Jesus did that, he signed his own death warrant. On Tuesday, he goes to the Mount of Olives and then ultimately comes back to Jerusalem where he has another confrontation with the Pharisees. And he says to them that day, he said, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're like, you're like sepulchers filled with dead men's bones. Meaning that they were just hollow on the inside and empty on the inside. On Wednesday, he kind of retires, ready for what is going to take place on Thursday, which would be the absolute onslaught of Satan and hell itself. On Thursday of Holy Week, Jesus eats the Last Supper. He and his men retire to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he moves deeper among the olive groves of Gethsemane's garden, Scripture says that he falls beneath a gnarled old olive tree and he begins to pray that if there's any other way for man to be redeemed, that God would let this cup pass 
from him. The scripture records it so graphically that he prayed with such intensity that his sweat became as great drops of blood. There from Gethsemane's garden, he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot on Thursday. The Sanhedrin arrest him. He is chained in the house of Caiaphas, one of the most moving places in my estimation on the planet. Many of you will remember when we stood right there in the house of Caiaphas and reflected upon it was the last place that Jesus would stay before he would go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. From the house of Caiaphas, he was taken on Thursday night and he was run through a series of mock trials lasting throughout Thursday. And then on Friday, the Lord Jesus would be forced to carry that cross down the Via Della Rosa all the way to the place of the skull, Golgotha, where he would lay down his life as an atonement for my sins and your sins and the sins of all the world. So every day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Good Friday, we call it good, but Friday, the day that he died, every day was filled with loneliness. Even on Saturday, as the scene of the crucifixion had begun to fade in the background, People clucked their tongues and they said, you know, I really thought he was going to be the one that would deliver us from Roman oppression. Even Simon Peter, fresh off his denial, said, I'm going fishing. That's all he knew to do. So what I want to do is do what Jesus asked us and to search the scriptures and see that they point to him. Go with me to verse number 39 and notice what he says. He says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. Now bear down on this last phrase. And they are they which testify of me. So circle that word scriptures. It is a reference to the Old Testament. You see, the Jewish people were constantly studying the Old Testament because they knew that the Old Testament was the word of God and the word of God would reveal to them uh, Messiah, their deliverer, when he would come. So they knew that Messiah was prophesied through those scriptures. Uh, so when you look at the next word, Jesus said, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Some translations use the word study. It can also be translated as research the scriptures. Here's what it really means. It means when you read it, to track it down to see what the real message is behind the scripture is, that we don't simply read scripture to get factual knowledge, or we don't re uh, read scripture to build up a, a reservoir of information, but we read scripture to find God and to understand who God is and what his plan is and what his message is. And even though these Jewish people were experts in reading the law, I mean, they looked at every line, line by line in the law. They knew where all the consonants were. They, they knew the word of God and the law of God frontward to back and backward. But here is the sticky part. Though they knew the words, they missed Messiah. Jesus was sitting right there in front of them. And he said, you search the scriptures and you see if they don't testify of me and speak to, about me and who I am. And how in the world, how in the world could you read the Bible and not see how it points to the Lord? Here's what William Barclay said. He said, the Jewish people, he said, they read it not to search for God, but to find arguments to support their own positions. They didn't really love God. They loved their own ideas about God. For quite a while, I taught homiletics in a Bible college, and homiletics is, is how to prepare and how to deliver sermons. And I had a number of pastors that would, uh, would, would be part of our class, and we talked about the importance of, of preaching the Word of God and staying faithful to God's Word. And what I always tried to share is that you never go to the Bible as a pastor to look for a sermon. And I try to never do that because I don't want to go just looking for something to preach. And I encourage my students, and I've tried to make a, a practice of this, is that we go to the Bible to find God. 
And when we find God, the sermon finds us. Amen? Same is true for a Sunday school lesson. When you go to the scripture to learn your Sunday school lesson, what you're really looking for is God. And when you find God, and that message is so ingrained in your heart, you can't wait to get to Sunday school on Sunday morning and teach what God has shared with you through that message. Well, the Jewish people weren't doing that. They were just reading it for information. They were just reading it because they were so filled with pride. And Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures. See if they don't testify of me. So here's what I want you to see. If you were to search the scriptures in the Old Testament, you would find over 300 prophecies. Over 300 prophecies that predict something about Jesus. Some of them over a thousand years before he was born. For example, hundreds of years before he was born, the Bible says he would be born in a stable, and he was. The Bible said he would be born from the tribe of Judah, and he was. The Bible says he would be born of a virgin, and he was. Jeremiah said that women would weep over the slain children at the slaughter of the innocents, and that's exactly what happened. That's just his birth. Hosea says, uh, he talks about his flight into Egypt to uh, avoid the wrath of King Herod. All of those events laid out perfectly, just like those Old Testament prophets said they would, hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. But listen, do you know there are many more Old Testament prophecies that speak to the death of Jesus? In fact, do you know in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, the last, the last day of his life, that thousands of years of Old Testament prophecies about his death were fulfilled to the most minute detail. That's why Jesus could say, to the Jews that day, you search the scriptures and you see if they don't point to me and talk, to, talk about me. Every single Old Testament passage that spoke to the death of Jesus, every single one of them took place. Do you know you can go to Daniel chapter number 9? And in Daniel chapter 9, the Bible says that after 483 years, after King Artaxerxes issues a proclamation that the, that the walls around Jerusalem be built, he said, Messiah the prince will be killed. Well, 483 years after that proclamation was A.D. 33, when Jesus went to the cross and died for the sins of the world. That's not by chance. That's not by accident. That's not by happenstance. How in the world could Daniel write that with such, with such uh, uh, accuracy 500 years before it happened. It is because God behind the scenes is orchestrating it and moving through the pen of those who would write down his word. So Jesus says, you scorch, search the scriptures and you see that they talk about me. So those Old Testament scriptures were written by many Old Testament personalities over many countries, but they were all fulfilled when we talk about his death on Good Friday. On Good Friday. If their study of Scripture was sincere, there is no way they could have missed Messiah. So let's look what happens in this passage. Remember Jesus says, search the Scriptures, and in verse 40, he says, you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, look at this, that you have not the love of God in you. Wow, what an indictment. No wonder they nailed him to the cross, right? That's not the best way to win friends and influence people, is it? Jesus looks them square in the eye and he says, I know you and I know that you do not have the love of God in your heart. And how true were his words. Because on Palm Sunday... They were ready to coronate him as king. But on Good Friday, they cried out, free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. On Palm Sunday, they said, he's Superman, going to deliver us from Rome. But my, how public opinion had turned by Friday. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children and our children's children. And it is just amazing how quickly the hearts of people were turned against him. That's why Jesus said, I know you. 
And I know that in your heart is not the love of God. Look in verse number 43. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. And if another comes in his own name, oh, name him who will you receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God only? Charles Spurgeon has given us a couple of beautiful quotes from this passage. Let me tell you what he says. Quote, When a man gets to feel that he ought to be honored, he is in extreme danger. End of quote. Let me give you another one. Quote, always receiving this undeserved honor, men deceive themselves into believing that they actually deserve it. End of quote. And then another. The praise of men generally turns the receivers of it into great cowards. End of quote. The Jewish leaders lived on the breath of others. The applause, the affirmation, the, the uh, support of others, and they were craving affirmation, and that's why they were feeding on the facts. But in the feeding on the facts, they had forgotten the person of the Scriptures. So what we're going to do for the balance of our time It'll take me about an hour and a half, all right? But what we're going to do, not really, what we're going to do on the balance of our time is I want to show you some of these Old Testament passages that speak to the loneliest week ever. Take your Bible, and if you're listening, say amen. Turn with me to Psalm 22. You can't hardly talk about Passion Week without looking at Psalm 22. It was written by King David um, about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And it's one of the greatest messianic chapters in all of the scripture, Psalm 22. And we're going to look at a number of these today. But, uh, and, then, and I'll try to pick up my pace just a little. But Psalm 22 this morning is where we will begin in the Old Testament. As I said, it's one of the greatest uh, messianic passages in all of the Old Testament. And uh, written by King David about his own anguish. But woven through Psalm 22, you find different passages that speak to the crucifixion of Jesus on Calvary's cross. It, in fact, it is very graphic. It graphically speaks to us about what happened on Calvary, again, a thousand years before you actually see it take place. Actually, if you, if you read the entirety of the chapter, we're not going to do that. I'm just going to give you two or three verses out of it. The chapter can be outlined this way. The servant of God forsaken, the servant of God rescued, and the servant of God triumphant. And when I read it, I feel like I'm standing on holy ground. It is a passage, listen, that beautifully dovetails. Psalm 22, don't forget this, beautifully dovetails with Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is one of my favorite chapters. Isaiah 53 is my favorite chapter that we'll look at in a minute. But Psalm 22 and Genesis 22 dovetail beautifully. What happened in Genesis 22? It was Abraham when he was to take his son Isaac to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Do you remember that? God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. By the way, do you know that's the first time love is mentioned in the Bible? Genesis 22. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. And it was to be a picture that day. Remember, Isaac was not sacrificed. Ultimately, there was a ram caught in the thicket that was used as a substitute. But in that very spot where that ram was sacrificed as a substitute for Isaac would be the same place that Jesus, the Lamb of God, thousands of years later, would die as a substitute on the cross of Calvary for you and I. So that's why I say it dovetails beautifully with Psalm 22. And let's look... At Psalm 22, notice uh, David wrote this psalm. He gives it to the choir director, uh, Elijah uh, Shehar, and he tells him, here's this song. You sing this song. In fact, some translations even kind of tell us an idea about the tune. If you carry the, the, uh, the, uh, the NIV, it was a tune of, of dough or something to that effect, if my memory serves me correctly. We don't really know what that tune is today. But we just know that it was a psalm that David wrote from the anguish of his soul. And look how it begins in verse number one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Now David, no doubt, went through times where he felt like he had been forsaken. But ultimately what he would be writing would be a prediction of Jesus' death on the cross. When on the cross of Calvary, there the dearest and the best would bleed his life's blood from his body and take his last breath and say, my God, why have you forsaken me? We call it the, the beatific vision, meaning that, that for all eternity, Jesus and God had been one uh, throughout eternity. But for the first time on the cross, when Jesus paid our sin debt, God turned his back on Jesus. And that's the first time they had ever been separated and God turned his back, and Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? And David wrote that a thousand years before it happened. Now, there are some who would say, oh, yeah, what Jesus was doing on the cross is simply, he was simply quoting poetry to try to get his mind off of the crucifixion. But we know what Jesus was doing was that he was crying out in agony over the forsakenness of God the Father. As he became the sin dead and embodied the sin of the world, God could not look upon that. So David starts in verse number one with the words that we would hear from the cross later on. My God, why have you forsaken me? Go down to verse number 14. Notice, I am poured out like water and all of my bones are, like, are out of joint and my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of, our, of my, my bowels. Do you know when the Roman soldier pierced the side of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, the Bible says that out of, out of his side came blood and water. And scholars tell us that it, it is an illustration that speaks to how the heart of Christ had ruptured on the cross and that his heart burst with the weight of the anguish that he endured. Look in verse 16. The psalmist said, again, this is a thousand years before Calvary. The psalmist said, for dogs have compassed me. You know what the Jews viewed Gentiles as? Dogs. And at the foot of the cross, they were marching around, humiliating Jesus. Notice, for dogs have compassed me as the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That happened a thousand years before the crucifixion. In John chapter 20, you find the account of this event where the Bible says that doubting Thomas in a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, he said, I'm not going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead unless I see the nail prints in his hand and can put my hand in the spear wound in his side. I'm not going to believe. But Jesus came and he showed him the nail prints in his hands. The spear wounds in his side, just as it unfolded on Calvary and just as the psalm was predicted a thousand years earlier, that's why Jesus said, search the scriptures and see that they don't speak to me. Do you know when Rome ruled Palestine in the first century, local rulers, Jewish rulers, did not have any authority to carry out the death penalty. Only Rome uh, could do that. So to put Jesus to death, they had to bring Jesus before the, the Roman governors. And they called for Pontius Pilate to announce his execution. In the times that, Jesus, uh, that the Jews did participate in capital punishment, it was never through crucifixion. Listen, do you know crucifixion had not even been invented when David wrote Psalm 22? But every time the Jews issued capital punishment, it was never with crucifixion. How was it? What was the method? It was always stoning. You remember Stephen, the first deacon? He was stoned. You remember the woman called in adultery? They brought her before the Lord, and they were ready to stone her. And Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. So the Old Testament never says, cursed is he that is stoned. But it does say, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And there on that tree that we called the cross, made of wood, would hang the Son of God, bearing the curse and the wrath of heaven. And the psalmist said it, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, if you're still in chapter 22, go down to verse number 18. Look at this. It's truly remarkable, the detail. They part my garments among them, 
and they cast lots upon my vesture. Again, that's a thousand years before it took place. And in John chapter 19, listen, the Bible says that the soldiers took the garment of Jesus, kind of divide them into four halves, and, and use those spoils for themselves. But when they come to his inner tunic, they said, oh, it's too nice to tear apart. Let's just gamble for it and see who gets it. And just exactly the way the psalmist said they would do it. That day, as Jesus died on the cross, those soldiers were gambling to see who would get his inner tunic. Do you think that's coincidence? Think that's happenstance? No, that's, that's the... That's the uh, exact nature of the Word of God, the precise nature of it. Turn over a couple of pages. Go to Psalm chapter 31. I told you I'm going to pick up the pace. I really mean that now. Psalm 31, look in verse number 12. Here is another prediction that happened years before it actually occurred. Psalm chapter 31, verse 12. I am forgotten as a dead man, out of mind, I'm like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Do you know the Bible says in Matthew 27 that very early in the morning, the religious leaders conspired of how they were going to kill Jesus. They were all working behind the scenes. Turn over another page to Psalm chapter 34. Look in verse number 20. Psalm 34, verse 20. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. John chapter 19 speaks to this as well. Do you know in order to expedite the death, the dying process of a, of a crucified individual, Roman soldiers would come with a large wooden mallet and they would literally break the shins of those who were on the cross to speed up the dying process. But the Bible says when they came to Jesus, they saw that he had already died, so they broke not his legs. In fact, one of the qualifications to be a perfect sacrifice in the Old Testament, not a single bone could be broken. So even to that degree, Jesus fulfills every bit of the Old Testament prophecies. Turn over to Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Let me show you a few more. Psalm 55. Again, if you're listening, say amen. Psalm 55. I don't want you to go to sleep on me now. Psalm 55. Look in verse number 12. Psalm 55, verse 12. Very sad passage in my estimation. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. Look at this, verse 13. But it was thou, a man, my equal, my guide, and my acquaintance. It is a reference to the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. Jesus was not turned over to his executioners by his enemy. He was turned over to his executioners by his friend. What hurts worse in life than the betrayal of a friend? What hurts worse than life than to have utmost confidence in somebody and then to see that friend turn, maybe a spouse or maybe even a child or a, a co-worker? That's painful. Well, the Bible says, in the Gospels, that in the night of the Garden of Gethsemane, that Judas, who had walked with Jesus for three years, comes to where he is, and as a signal to the Roman soldiers, he gives Jesus the kiss of betrayal on the cheek. Ultimate betrayal. It was not an enemy, Jesus would say, but it was one of my own friends. Fulfilled exactly like the psalmist said. Turn over a few more pages to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, look in verse 20. I love to hear those Bible pages turn, don't you? Psalm 29, 69, verse 20. Reproach, look at this, has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. 
And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comfort, uh, comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall or bitterness for my food. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Three different times the New Testament records that Jesus was offered vinegar while he was on the cross of Calvary. Three different times. First time he rejected it. The next time they just kind of use it to mock him. And finally, before he would breathe his last, he said, I thirst. And they put it on a, a branch, a hyssop branch, and they lifted it up to his mouth. And the Bible says he took that sour wine or that vinegar and he died. It, it had already been predicted a thousand years before it ever happened. One more in the Psalms. Go to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. Good gracious. I said an hour and a half. That may not be an exaggeration. Psalm 109, verse 25. Look at this. I became a reproach unto them, and when they looked upon me, they shake their heads. Matthew 27 says, those who passed by him, they wagged their heads, they sat down, they had lunch, and watched him writhe in anguish and pain. Just a few more. Turn over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 50, look in verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and from spitting. Isaiah wrote that 700 years before it actually took place. But the Bible tells us in Matthew 27 that as Jesus went through his trial, they pulled out his beard and they spit on him. Turn over a page to my favorite chapter, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. <clears throat> And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that on the day of crucifixion, when all the trumped up charges were levied against him, that never one time did he speak in his own defense. Never one time did he speak up and say, let me set the record straight. But I want you to know he just endured it. He just accepted it. He just let them say all manner of things about him, and he never dignified it with a response. But as a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. He just took it. Go to verse number, uh, verse number 9 in Isaiah 53. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Do you remember the Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a very wealthy man, asked for the body of Jesus from the cross, took that body, washed it, wrapped it in a linen garment, and placed it in a tomb. Again, Isaiah said that it was going to happen. Go to verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. Remember the two the two uh, criminals on the cross next to him. He bare the sin of many, look at this, and he made intercession for the transgressors. He said to the thief on one side of him, today you will be with me in paradise. And he said for all of the world, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Bible had already said that would happen 700 years before it happened. A couple more. If you're in Isaiah, you've got Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Go to the book of Amos very quickly. Amos chapter 8, and look in verse number 9. Amos chapter 8. If you don't have time to get it, you can just write it down. I'm going to read it to you. It came to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon. What? I'll cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. When did that happen? That happened at 12 o'clock on the day that Jesus died on the cross. He went to the cross at 9 o'clock. And from 9 o'clock until, until 12 o'clock, it was daylight. And then the Bible says darkness fell across the landscape from 12 until 3 as Jesus died for the sins of the world. Amos had already said that would happen over 500 years 
before it actually took place. Uh, keep going in your Old Testament. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. All right, find the book of Zechariah. I'm going to give you a couple more. We'll close. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Zechariah verse, chapter 11, verse 12. And I said to them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they, look at this. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. How much was Jesus sold for into the hands of his captors? 30 pieces of silver. No way. Authors who didn't even know each other, writing on three different continents, three different languages, over a period of 1,500 years, could have just happened to put all that together. It had to be God that was working behind the scenes to bring all of this to pass. Go to chapter 13 of Zechariah, just right across the page. Look in verse number 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 14 on the day that Jesus was crucified that all of the disciples left him. That's why we call it the loneliest week in the world. Within a 24-hour period of time, thousands of years of prophecy came to pass through the death of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in John 5, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures because they testify of me. And in those scriptures you will find that I am the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon and the bride and the morning star and the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end. Read those scriptures, search them, study them, research them, and you will find that they all point to Jesus who would go to that cross and die for the sins of the world. Let me close this way. Perhaps you have heard many years ago of a mathematician by the name of Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner looked at eight specific prophecies of Jesus and he calculated the mathematic probability of one of those eight prophecies coming to, tr coming to pass with the accuracy that the scripture says it. All right? According to his calculations, this is what he said. The probability that one of those predictions would have come to pass is this. One in 10 to the 17th power. Now, I don't know very much about math. I know that is, I know that is uh, one to the 10th with 17 zeros behind it. He illustrates it this way. He said if you took one in, the 17, one in 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars, you would have enough silver dollars to, to cover the entire state of Texas three foot deep. All right? And then you take one silver dollar and you put a mark on it. And you flip that silver dollar somewhere in that pile of silver dollars throughout the state of Texas, and you take one man, blindfold him, and you spin him around, and you walk him across the state of Texas, and the probability that he will bend over and pick up that one marked silver dollar is one in 10 to the 17th power, meaning it is impossible. But yet... God's word said that it was going to happen with the most minute detail. And Jesus came and he fulfilled the minutest detail to show us that he really is God in the flesh. And when he died on the cross, it was God dying for the sins of the world. And I will close with the words of Russ Ramsey. Listen to what he writes. Jesus' resurrection opened the door between heaven and the fallen, groaning world into which he was born and the renewal of all things. The door was a stone rolled back by the very finger of God from the mouth of a grave outside Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, God's eternal son, present at creation, came in the flesh to be the mediator between God God and man lived a life of perfect righteousness that all men have failed to live. He died as a lamb led to the slaughter, offering himself up as the perfect sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world once and for all. And he rose from the grave, defeating death itself, bearing all authority in heaven and on earth. And he lives as the appointed heir of all things. He rules over every corner of creation, putting every enemy under his feet while making alive by his grace through faith those who were dead in their sins. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word and the truth 
and the veracity of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, that when we look at the loneliest week ever and retrace those steps of Jesus, we saw that you had already wrote about it hundreds and even thousands of years earlier. So God, thank you for this love letter that you've given to us. As we have this time of invitation, we don't want anyone to leave this place without knowing that this love letter was written to them. And that God, when you were writing this, you had them on your mind because Lord, sin separated us from you. But Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all that we would be washed as white as snow and we could come to you and have a brand new start if there's one under the sound of my voice that's never been saved, never trusted Jesus to pay it all, then my prayer is during this invitation they would come and they would accept that wonderful gift of eternal life that you so graciously offer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.